Okay, I'd like to call to order the December 12th Historic Resource Board meeting for the City of San Juan Batista. Uh, can we start with the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Two missing, they're both excused, correct? They were called in, they'll work, okay. That's correct. Yes. Good deal. Okay, before we get to public, I'm apologize for not making the last few meetings, but just the way it is, we don't have enough staffing at work for me to get a day off, so um, here I am. I made it. <laughs> so, um, number two, we have public comment for items that are not on the agenda. Do we have any public comments for items not on the agenda? I don't have any. Kennedy, do we have any, any informal project reviews? Mr. Chair, I have no request for informal project reviews tonight. Okay. All right. Four, we're down to the consent agenda. Um, I need to approve the affidavit of posting and approve the minutes for September 3rd. Does anybody want to pull those? Anybody from the audience want to pull those? Okay. Any motion on that? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the affidavit of posting and the minutes for the September 3rd meeting. All second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. That was three. That's it. Okay. Ready. And action items. Uh, recommend to the Planning Commission approval of a site and design review for a building in the historic uh, downtown at 107 3rd Street. Uh, the APN is 002-210-004. That's the La Casa Rosa building. You're up. Thank you. You're welcome. Good afternoon, Chair Friels and Commission members. Uh, really quick before I start, I'll just introduce myself. I am David Mack. I am a contract planner. The um, Don Reynolds brought on board to help with the city. So uh, I work for Harrison Associates, just staff augmentation, help Todd and Don out uh, on selected items. But I did want you to know who I was since I'm a new face to many of you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, the project before you now is Casa Rosa, Site Development Review 2019-9, or excuse me, dash 03. The site is located at 107 3rd Street in a mixed use historic downtown zoning district and is approximately 0.9, should be 0 0.095 acres. Sorry, it is not almost an acre. It is about one-tenth of an acre. I apologize for the typo. This is the current situation of Casa Rosa, uh, known as the beautiful pink building uh, in downtown. However, uh, as I'm sure the audience and citizens of San Juan Batista are aware, prior activity on this building did result in most of the previous structure being demolished uh, without the benefit of permits. Uh, so there is no back to the building, simply just the side you can see that has the chimney, the front facade, and the, um, the other side uh, next to the neighboring adobe. As I mentioned previously, there was a previous entitlement granted by the city in 2017, which allowed a restaurant slash bar a two-bedroom residence upstairs and a shed garage and utility space in the rear of the property for a total of about 3,600 square feet and an FAR or floor area ratio of just under 0.9. At the time, the Planning Commission approved two resolutions, one for a CEQA exemption, which was attachment three of your staff report, and for that actual project approval, which was attachment four for your records. The current project picks up where the 2017 entitlement left off, being that it is a mixed use development request consisting of a restaurant and bar um, or commercial retail and four residential units. 
So I do want to call attention to the residential units. The previous project did not include residential units in the back. Simply one residential unit in the upstairs portion of the main building, which was a two bedroom, two bath. Uh, the square footage in this proposal mimics the exact entitlement of that, the exact square footage of the previous entitlement. However, it does add three units in the rear, all of them being one bedroom, one bath, ranging between 357 square feet and 471 square feet. And I wish this slide was a little clearer, but this is the site plan for uh, the property. And if you don't mind, I'll actually walk over and point and, and bring the microphone as far as I can. I'll, I'll use the shadow. So this is the current area of the main building. No, no, I'm good, I'm good. Uh, the current area of the main building, front facade here off of 3rd Street, restaurant bar, um, kitchen space, outside dining area. And then in the new plan as you progress back, this is one unit, another unit. Excuse me, this is the utility restroom that would be available, one unit here one unit here, and one unit there. Um, actually, there, no, I, I apologize, I wish I had a pointer. This is a one bedroom unit. This is a one bedroom unit. That's a utility bathroom area, and the rest is kitchen and restroom in the main building. And then we get to the second level site plan. Um, and again, this would be the same square footage as the previous two bedroom, two bath unit in the main building, and then a, an additional one bedroom, one bath on the second floor in the rear of the building with a stairway that accesses and traverses the rooftop to the deck. A little confusing, but I uh, wanted to try to explain that. The project does meet all development standards found in chapter 1103 um, for the mixed use district. Uh, there is not a minimum lot area for that. Um, the minimum lot width is 25 feet. This project is wider than 25 feet. The mixed use allows a density, a base density of 8 to 15 acres. Uh, a floor area ratio that uh, within historic downtown structures may be 1.5. Uh, building coverage of 0.85. A maximum height and stories of three stories or 50 feet and four setbacks front side and rear 10% uh, of the lot width or 10 feet whichever is less and the proposed project does meet the site and height um, setbacks so again on the bottom of the slide the allowed FAR is upwards of 1.5 the proposed project is 0 0.95 so below the allowed FAR which makes it consistent the allowable coverage is 0.85 and the proposed project is 0.6. So within the allowable coverage uh, and the allowable height and stories is three, three stories, 50 feet. And this project will measure about two stories or 25 to 30 feet. So again, consistent with the development standards chart found in the zoning ordinance. As detailed over 11 plus pages in your staff report, uh, the project is consistent with zoning and general plan policies, uh, section 1106.120 for the historic resources permitting, being that this is in the re historic resources area. There was a historic report prepared in 2017 for the previous entitlement that determined that all work within the main historic building was consistent with the Secretary of the Interior standards for renovation or rehabilitation. The project is consistent with section 1118 for site plan review and um, I detailed in the staff report at least eight general plan policies ranging from historic resource preservation to housing um, and mixed use entitlements that this project would comply with and meet. And I'd be happy to go over these in detail if the HRB or uh, commission would like me to do so. Uh, but I did want to highlight some of the major, I guess, concerns from the public that staff heard about. One of them is parking. Um, there is a section in the municipal code, 1111-130, uh, that allows the city manager to waive on-site parking if a parcel is unable to accommodate parking due to the shape, size, location, or presence of the building. Uh, I did circle on the site plan the existing driveway or access to the site um, off of Franklin Street. That driveway measures nine and a half feet, nine and a half to ten feet. 
Um, so feasibly, you could put a single vehicle there, but when they got into that site, there would not be adequate turnaround space. Um, and you would either have somebody backing in or backing out. And from a public health and safety view, that would not be preferable. Um, additionally, that driveway is located approximately one foot from the adjacent property line off of Franklin Street. There's a single family house there. Um, and vehicular movement uh, in that close vicinity to your house um, would also not be preferable for public health and safety. So from staff's point of view, this driveway does not um, function in a safe or allow safe vehicular movement. In this particular case, the city manager did not specifically waive on-site parking, but left that to the HRB and commission to weigh the options. Um, additionally, there's sections that for on-street parking in the municipal code that allow parcels within the mixed use district to utilize and count available on-street parking spaces only if they are within 150 feet. Um, and all of those spaces can, can be counted towards parking compliance. This project needs to comply or needs to supply three parking spaces, one for each of the single new one bedroom units. Um, the parking allocation for the restaurant was covered under the 2017 entitlement when no additional parking was required at that time because of the historic use of the restaurant that had been there before. So a like for like use does not require additional parking. So we're talking roughly about three parking spaces. Um, staff, Todd Kennedy and myself uh, walked San Juan Batista and we roughly counted all on-street parking spaces within 150 feet of the property lines um, along 3rd Street, Franklin Street, and Washington Street and there are between 20 and 25 or more available parking spaces. It doesn't mean that they didn't have cars parked in them, but they are available for potential parking. Uh, so with that count, staff believes that the available on-street parking is sufficient to meet the requirement of three parking spaces. However, moving uh, through the municipal code further, section 1111.120 for off-street parking reduction allows mixed-use developments to reduce parking by 10 spaces or 25%, whichever is greater, if the parcel is within 400 feet of a public parking lot or garage. Uh, so on the map, I highlighted where the project site is. It's the little L shape highlighted in red. And where there is available, for lack of a better phrase, public parking area um, along Washington Street. So the site is within 400 feet of a public parking area. In fact, it is approximately 132 feet from that parking area. Um, so for the commission and the, the board's consideration, um, they you could consider that this parking between on-street and off-site um, does require or does satisfy the requirement for three parking spaces. If inclined, the reduction of 10 parking spaces that could be granted by this would again satisfy those three required parking spaces. Moving further through the code, and I'm just laying out all the options in the municipal code so there's clarity for everybody, 1111120F um, allows a, the payment of an in-lieu parking fee which can be imposed by the Planning Commission, subject to subsection B, which I discussed earlier, which is the off-street parking reduction, if the Commission believes that off-street parking reduction is warranted. Again, there's between 20 and 25 available parking spaces um, within 150 feet of the site and 10 to 15 public parking spaces within 400 feet of the site. Um, the project is currently not conditioned to require payment of that fee. Uh, this is a decision point for the HRB and the Planning Commission to weigh because again staff believes that there are options to consider that parking has been adequately addressed. However, if the Commission wants to add that fee, you must determine the appropriate amount um, and just for reference, and I think uh, John or myself could get into this more if needed, the current listed in lieu parking fee is $7,700 per space. So we'll just throw that out there. Um, and I guess the question is, is this an appropriate fee for the reduction of three spaces? The next main issue or, or uh, concern is the provision of affordable housing. This project is pr proposing four total units, again, three one bedroom, one bath in the rear, uh, and one two bedroom, two bath in the main building, 
They will all be restricted as moderate income, so this is a one, can be considered a 100% affordable housing project um, with a proposed eight-year term controlling the affordable housing agreement. Uh, and then just for reference, the one bedroom, one bath under the um, affordable housing chart would rent for about $1,703 or no more than $1,703. It could rent for less, market dictating. Um, and the two bedroom would, could not rent for more than $1,946. And again, just an aside, those rents generally need to include utilities. So that is not in addition to utilities. Under the state legislation that's been passed in the recent years, there's section 65915B1D and 65915F4, which grants the applicant um, a 35% density bonus and one concessionary entitlement if they are proposing housing above 40% affordable. And again, this is a 100% affordable housing project, so the applicant would be entitled to the density bonus and one entitlement or concession, which is by right, that the applicant under this legislation gets to pick their concession or entitlement. The city does not, unfortunately. <laughs> so the proposed project is 100% affordable and all four units. The base density, as I mentioned earlier, is eight to 15 units per acre, which would by itself allow two units on the site. With the 35% density bonus, the site would be granted one additional unit for three total. And the applicant has requested that their one by right concession or incentive be the additional unit for a total of four. The justification for that uh, incentive and the additional unit is required due to the cost of the restoration rehabilitation costs of the main building. Uh, and without the ability to generate some other income on the site in the rear of the property, the project could be infeasible uh, without the increased site revenue and income. Moving through affordable housing further, uh, the city of San Juan Batista has what they call ARENA or a regional housing needs assessment. The city is required to construct 41 total affordable units and eight of those 41 shall be at the moderate income rate. Again, this project proposes four units, all moderate. So this project alone could satisfy 50% of the required moderate units or four of eight and just over 10% of the overall ARENA being four of 41. Um, the project is subject, in a sense, to California Environmental Quality Act. However, Class 31 provides an exemption, which is limited to, and I'm just going to read it all for the record, maintenance, repair, stabilization, rehabilitation, restoration, preservation, conservation, or reconstruction of historical resources in a manner consistent with the Secretary of the Interior Standards for the Treatment of Historic Properties with the guidelines for preserving, rehabilitating, restoring, and reconstructing historic buildings. Uh, as I said, the previous 2017 report concluded that uh, the main restoration project granted to the Burdas in 2017 would be consistent. The current applicant, uh, Raid, is mimicking that entitlement for the main building, and the project can be considered exempt from CEQA under 15331 Class 31 exemption. And finally, I want to call your attention to a memo you found on the dais for some additions and amendments. Staff would like to delete condition one requiring a development agreement. Um, after further consideration, staff does not believe that this project is complex enough to require the signature and recordation of a development agreement. Um, it would just be staff time and expenses and legal fees incurred that don't really need to be done. Uh, staff would also like to recommend deletion of condition nine, which unfortunately was empty and had no language there. And then renumber the remaining conditions accordingly. So there will still be a condition nine, um, nine through 32 after that is renumbered. And then finally add condition 33, which would be a new condition. And the language is on the memo, which pertains to the formula retail compliance within the municipal code. Um, just stating that any formula retail use would need to require a use permit and there would need to be specific findings made by the planning commission for how it could affect uh, other businesses in the city with that staff does recommend that the historic resources board and later the planning commission take the following actions adopt a resolution to find the project exempt from CEQA and adopt a resolution approving the project per the findings and evidence 
and subject to the recommended conditions of approval as amended by the memo. And I would be happy to answer any questions. Questions, Shirley? Uh, the driveway, you said, uh, you know, it can't be used for parking. What, what can it be used for? Well, after looking at the driveway, um, there will be a restaurant there. It could be used as a service entrance. Um, I would not recommend that service trucks drive down there. There currently is no curb cut along Franklin Street, but trucks could park there, um, use hand cards or hand carry products back there. Um, I would say that that would be preferable to parking off of Third Street, um, but if the commission does not want any activity there, or de depending on uh, what business is conducted in the main building, um, it could be fenced off or just used as kind of open space for the residential area. Uh, at this time, there's nothing proposed for the use of that. It would just remain fenced on either side and visible from the street. That's also access for the residential. Yeah, right. it would also be access for residential. Uh, the, the proposed residents would could use that as a walkway. And it could be used as a path as well. It, right, and and additionally, that would also be ADA access to the restaurant. Okay. Um, there's no ADA accessible ramp or um, mechanism to get into the main building from Third Street. That would require significant alteration to the front of the building. Okay, and, and for parking, 400 feet public parking. Uh, it's way within 100, uh, 400 feet. Is there any other public parking available? Um, yeah, the there's surface street parking uh, along multiple streets. Uh, again, Mr. Public Kennedy, parking. Hmm? Public parking within the 400 feet. Um, I think the only other potential public parking I'm aware of was the old bank site, but that's normally, yeah. Uh, the other one, which is hard to see on here, my cursor doesn't show up, would be kind of located over here by the old brewery or behind JJ's Burgers. But again, I don't think that's public parking. I believe that that's private parking. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's really the only public parking area that I for sure identified within 400 Okay. Feet. If I could, I could speak to that. Um, as I was coming on board to the city in June, the previous city manager had commissioned a parking study and the potential for the city to lease uh, some of the vacant surface lots in town and turn them into surface lots. Um, initially, the first thing I needed to do was hire a parking enforcement because you can't have a parking plan for a downtown without enforcement. So we've done that and uh, the city at some point will be poised to move forward to provide more public parking. And that way, uh, the burden is shared by all of the uh, business owners and, and enjoyed by all of their clients uh, uniformly across the board. So that's in the future. Uh, I'll get there as soon as we can. But I just wanted to make you aware of that. Okay. That's all I got. I'm wondering uh, how our delivery is going to be made to the restaurant and bar. Where will they park to do that? Um, I'll, I'll leave the definitive answer on that to the applicant because he, he kind of knows his business plan. But again, uh, most deliveries could either be made either by parking along 3rd Street or, you know, along Franklin um, and either hand trucked in through here or carried. Um, heavy deliveries probably wouldn't want to be carried. But uh, I don't think at this time the applicant knows exactly what business or restaurant will go in there. Um, if I understand it correctly and, and Raid can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I believe he's going to re rehabilitate the building and then potentially try to find a tenant for that. And as the tenant is discovered, uh, that will dictate whether or not there's deliveries that need to be made to that business or not, and what kind of deliveries or what delivery trucks would show up. So it's really not a restaurant and bar at this point. It's just rehab. Right. Well, it's being proposed as a restaurant or bar. Uh, from a planning use as intensity, as, as you think about a use, uh, the Burdas were granted a restaurant bar. The applicant is proposing at this time to hopefully put in a restaurant or bar there. But any like retail or other lunch dinner area would either be consistent or less intense than the intensity generated by a restaurant bar. Um, so if he wanted to put in like say a mom and pop coffee shop or um, an ice cream shop or custom donut shop or something like that, it would generate less foot traffic 
Well, I'm just a, 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 bike, a bike shop that sells uh, bike shop, uh, bike smoothies. shop, skateboard yeah. shop, snowboard shop. I mean, something. All of those would generally generate less <laughs> foot traffic um, and intensity than a restaurant or bar. So the applicant stuck with the proposal of a restaurant bar to make sure they had options. Uh, and again, that was the reason for adding the um, formula retail condition to the project. Are there setback requirements other than just the front? I believe that it's 10 feet from the front. Is that the same? In the mixed use zone, um, this chart, I'm going the wrong way, I apologize. Um, so on, for the mixed use, the minimum setback, front side and rear, notes to uh, note 10, and it's hard to read up there, but 10% of the depth of the lot or 10% whichever is less, and then planning commission may allow deviations of the setbacks based on individual project site plan and building layout. Um, I bring that up because the original 2017 approval allowed the same footprint within a foot of the rear as this project is proposing. So while this project is as detailed in the staff report, moderately bigger, about 300 square feet bigger. The additional square feet is not to the rear of the property where this red circle is. It's actually due to the, again, I'm going the wrong direction. It's actually due to the addition of the residents upstairs. So the general bottom first floor footprint that you see there is exactly what was granted by the two, 2017 entitlement, which is still a valid entitlement. Um, so theoretically, the applicant could build the same exact footprint. Um, the reason for this coming back to the HRB and the Planning Commission is simply the addition of the residential units and mainly the one upstairs. Um, we had a, a letter from uh, one of the residents that, that has property right there and and one of the concerns is um, the drainage. Uh, and is there any way that we can make sure that a higher property doesn't drain onto the? Yeah, un under the new uh, California building codes, actually every project in California needs to retain drainage on site okay. um, as standard BMP practices. So. The project is not conditioned to do that because that's a standard state requirement condition. So they have to do it no matter what or whatever. Right. And you know the other thing is uh, the, the tree. I'm a tree hugger myself and yeah. and I know that, that that's really important because of the historic nature of, of that too if they could make sure that they do. So there is a tree on site. Um, let's see if I can get my little arrow to come up here. It, it uh, is located right about there I believe. Um, unfortunately, it is not a designated or protected, designated historic tree. Um, so I don't think at this time the tree is proposed to stay. For a number of reasons, it could potentially restrict ADA access to the site. Um, and I'm sure you may hear from some public comment or have heard from some correspondence. There are sewer lines that run at that approximate area. Um, and without knowing where the roots are or the condition of the sewer lines, that's always a concern. But I'll leave that up to the applicant when he gets up to address what he would like to do with that tree. Is your ADA access to the second floor? Um, I don't believe the second floor has ADA access. But I'm, I, all of the, the two ground level floors in the restaurant would have ADA access. I, got one more question. I just wondered about the, um, I thought that was a federal requirement whenever any modifications or anything like this is done is that it has to be ADA compliant. From my understanding, for housing, you have to have at least one ADA accessible unit, and this would have two. And then for the restaurant, there would have to be ADA accessibility built in, um, which is actually through this, this area right here. Not through the front door. It's through yeah, the so there would be no ADA access through the front, but through the project uh, for the restaurant commercial area, which would require ADA access, it would be right through here. Uh, last question, why, does this, why have you not conditioned uh, the project uh, with the painted in blue. So Staff has not conditioned the project with the payment of uh, a fee in lieu. I'm wondering why. I'll, I'll, if you don't mind, Don, I'll try to take a stab at that. <laughs> um, the main reason is, as, as I did the analysis of the municipal code, there were um, conflicting sections. For example, 11, 11, 13 allows 
potentially the city manager to waive on-site parking based on site topography. In this case, uh, that did not happen, not because the finding couldn't be made, but just because we felt that was more appropriate for this body to weigh in on. Uh, the next section, 1111-120A, um, could basically conclude that the three parking spaces that need to be supplied could be counted as on-street parking. Uh, if that decision is made, then the payment of in lieu fee parking wouldn't need to be done. Um, and then finally, uh, the section 111120B, which allows either a reduction of 10 sp spaces or 25%, whichever is greater, which would be the 10, um, due to the off street public parking area within 400 feet could also count as consistency for the required parking, which would also then not require the payment of in lieu fee. Um, but then the third section, which conflicts the first two a little bit, states that based on B, if the commission believes that offside parking reduction is warranted, again, not, not the first 150 foot measurement, but the 400 foot, that the commission could add the fee. So that was a decision point that staff didn't feel we could say yes, it should be conditioned or no, it shouldn't. Um, and I just wanted to present the facts to the commission. So, and and I, can an, I can answer as, as well. Yeah. Um, I put a lot of thought into this, and, and we went back and studied where the $7,000 fee came from. Uh, first of all, it's a total of about $25,000, and, and that by itself is not going to go very far towards uh, improving one of those uh, vacant lots and turning it into a parking lot. Um, so uh, with, that, with that in mind, um, where did that $7,000 fee come from? And it looked like... Um, Mr. Grimsley did a back of a napkin. This is what I think a surface parking uh, space would look like. It's not actually a nexus, so that could be challenged technically. It's not an engineering study by any means. Um, I'm also nervous about the fact that, uh, that we already issued an entitlement for this property in 2017 with no parking required. And uh, we could fall back, the owner could fall back on that if he wanted to. So we're a little bit vulnerable there. Um, and thirdly, um, in my experience in downtown Salinas, we had a similar project um, uh, that added uh, floor space uh, downtown on the 100 block. And at the same time, we were building a parking structure. And what we asked uh, as a condition in, in lieu of an in lieu fee was that um, we added a condition and we could do that to this project that says that when we come up with a formal parking program in the next uh, six to 18 months, that, that they're obligated to participate in it. In this case, the restaurant was required to buy employees uh, uh, permanent parking spaces or parking passes in the, uh, in the municipal parking lot and that would keep them off the street and, and out of the way of the, the ongoing uh, uh, customers coming and going. So it causes the employees then to park off site in that lot and that's a $30 per month fee uh, for a permit, something of that nature. So that, that would be uh, true for all of the business owners downtown. They could be buying these monthly permits for them, for their employees, and therefore freeing up the on-site, the on-street parking for their uh, customers. So that was the option I thought, in my mind, was the most reasonable. Um, so I just throw that on the table as the commission uh, deliberates tonight uh, to think about how to best manage parking moving forward downtown. It's, um, uh, with one particular council member, this became a 90-minute conversation about Casa Rosa. It turned into a huge conversation about parking. So I, we have put a lot of thought into it, um, and, and that's, that's where I'm at at this point. But it's ultimately your decision. Yeah, I, I had one more question. Uh, sorry to jump in here, but um, you, we have the new project that we're looking at now. We're... The old project was just one residential unit on the second story. Where was the access for that unit? The access for that building was originally intended to be from an internal staircase. However, that internal staircase has since been demolished in the unpermitted work that occurred. And that internal staircase um, was not considered historic, so it's not required to be replaced. And it also added kind of a residential access through the middle of a commercial setting, um, which I'm definitely not the expert, but it brings up safety concerns. You know, do you have residential people walking into the middle of your restaurant? Do you have people from the restaurant walking up the residential staircase? Um, so I think with this developer, I don't want to put words in his mouth. He may have thought about that and just tried to provide um, access that was going to be 
feasible but not affect the commercial space and try to keep those as separate as possible. Okay. But again, the, the original, original building, not yeah. even the Burgess. Yeah. Casa Rosa itself. Yeah. Um, back. It, and, and none of the side lots will have uh, enough room for access for the second uh, story unit. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it would be a it would be a walkway. That's ten feet long. I mean, it would function like an alley. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I like the fact that we we're kind of ahead of the game on the the affordable housing. That's being mandated by the state, um, and it's uh, it's voluntary, which is kind of nice. I mean, if we if somebody volunteers to build this, it's good instead of somebody being forced to build it. Um, probably, we probably have some questions for the developer. I'm sure, handful. Sure. I probably have a few. Yeah. Can we can we go ahead and put, sir? Would you like to come up? Sure. Thank you. Good evening, Chair, Commissioners, uh, Ray Farhad, a developer. I think they did a great job presenting it. I don't think I would change anything from what they said. They did a, they did a really good job of presenting the, the project the way it is. I guess the only thing I would add is it's a historical preservation project as far as what we're doing. And the architect who we have to do it is one, a well-renowned, I mean, historical preservation expert. Um, and just take that note, we are, preserving the historical integrity of the property to, the much, to as much as we can uh, with the materials that are still on site and what we could source. Uh, it's not just a remodel or a rehab. Um, without the residential component, this project does not work just because of this, the space of the commercial and not knowing who the tenant would be and what that use would be. Um, without the residential component, this project does not pencil out in any way. So if you guys have any questions, be more than happy to um, sure. answer those. Any questions? Uh, not, not at this time. Not right now. Okay. Have, sir, have you ever tackled a historic restoration? I have. I've yeah. done some in Watsonville. I'm currently doing a 49-unit subdivision that requires the movement of a historical school, 1903 schoolhouse. And I have to move it from the back end of the property, about 200 feet forward, and convert it in from a school into a residential uh, house. Oh, okay. So. Well, that's, you're way ahead of the last group yeah, we had yeah, so. tearing that place apart. I'm sure you know how things, I'm sure they explained you how things work. We're, we're kind of two, the same people, but two governing boards. So sometimes people get a little bit confused. Sometimes I get a little bit confused. But, um, As you like. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's look at um, the thing that's going to affect the buildings in the historic zone, in the historic district. Um, so your whole, the <coughs> rear of the building, um, the, the addition of the, uh, the residence and, and the whole works, we, it's, the, the plans are great. It's just there's not much detail to what it's going to look like. Correct. Uh, at this point, because they're not construction drawings. It just is just, sure. and when you initially did these plans, I think we did them like in a week. I mean, as far as from when we thought we were yeah. going to be on, we were we thought we were gonna be on the October 1st planning commission meeting. I bought the property, I think October 6th or 7th. I, I bought the property actually after I had the architect do this. I think, we, no, it was two weeks actually, I think what we had. So initially we thought, okay, let's try to work on what we're gonna have, be able to make it for the October 1st um, planning commission meeting because I wanted, before I closed escrow, I wanted to see if it was gonna be able to be approved before I invested the money I did into purchasing it. Mm -hmm. So the architect came up with the design as far as it was there based on the exact same footprint that was approved back in 2017. Um, used some of the storage space. The restaurant was gonna be a lot bigger use, um, which didn't make sense just because of the size. Um, so it made the restaurant space a little bit smaller. The storage space in the added kitchen made it into um, residential component, which we felt Every jurisdiction in every city throughout the state of California is always talking about needing housing. Um, when I was talking with Don, we talked about how could we do it to make it win for everybody. He said, well, if you would be willing to do a uh, affordable housing, um, that would help us. Um, I looked at it, looked at the numbers, said if we're able to get this number of units there, it would work for us as well. 
Um, but yeah. no, I, I, I get that. that we don't, I, I wouldn't want to jump through a bunch of and that was a financial week's hoops myself. That, that, was a week's worth of, go, uh, so, yeah. that was a week's worth of time that the architect had to go from what he had previously been worked on before into converting into giving somewhat of an idea of what it would look like. And you're the same same architect. Same architect. And for the for the historic building and the addition, it'll be the same. The same so group. he's the one who did this to now. I yeah. haven't got. I'm not going to sit here and say I've gotten into a contract with him to moving forward. Okay. That is the plan. The plan okay. is moving forward if he wants to and if he's has the time to take the project on and get it completed in the time that I want as well. Sure, and we'll just have you come back and then a, a later date and show us. Yeah. Yeah. I, what I mentioned to both Don and Todd is that. So I'm in the Romas, so even though I don't live in San Juanista, I am close. We do come here, and I, I do get now how important Casa Rosa is for the residents. Mm -hmm. And I do want, when we came to the October meeting, it was more of an informal meeting, just kind of, hey, this is what we're thinking about doing. Um, the Planning Commission didn't take any position, nor was it an item for them to vote on. We want to be transparent as far as with what we're, we're doing. We're not going to do anything that is going to be without permits or wondering what it's gonna look like, whether it was us putting color renderings on the outside once we have them, when it gets to the uh, building stage as far as what it's gonna look like, we would have, we could have put big color poster-like renderings either sure. here or on the site for any resident who wants to see what it would look like. It's hard to read plans for most people, so we would actually have nice color renderings as far as what it would look like, with the elevations, different sites, and that would give a perception of what the, the build-out would look like. And that. The reason I'm bringing it up is that's a public concern. Correct. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody heard publicly that this isn't the end of the that this isn't the end of the uh, of are, our. These are very preliminary uh, drawings, just to kind of give an idea. This was basically the minimum we could do at the point to get on the planning commission. Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds good. Anything else? Okay, we'll bring up public comment. Do we have public comment? Darlene Boyd. Good evening. I'd like to thank you for being here tonight, and I do appreciate all the work you put in. <laughs> and um, for one, I, I really like this project. The worst thing um, for a building is to leave it unattended and unused. This results in neglect, and we have seen this happen enough around this town. We have, I know, another building that's being, that has been neglected, and we don't know what we're going to do with that. Another study. I know that people have mentioned that they, they think there should be another study, but that I don't think we need another one. There's delay of many months. It's been studied quite a bit in the past two years. Um, there's been at least four engineers and several other contractors that have looked at it. Reports have been issued that it's safe for now, but not for an extended period of time. And it was rescued by council members John Freeman and Dan DeVries from total destruction by a previous city manager and um, Ed Tweez also helped them quite a bit to rescue that and we don't want to let this happen again to have this building lost because somebody thinks that it ought to be torn down. The buyer is willing to retain and keep up the exterior the same as it is now so its iconic look does not change. The street view will not change and that is a critical factor for our historical uh, ambiance that we want to keep maintained in this town. Another restaurant is really good. We'd like to have a lot of those because we want to be a destination town for tourists. And um, the health of, uh, and I think that, you know, restoring it would certainly help Ms. Renzel's uh, shop next door, especially since the water won't be draining on you. <laughs> and I do like the idea of the affordable housing rentals. That's putting us ahead of the game. That's very good. And um, I do want to mention that prefer, I prefer the driveway for service access because I, I get sick and tired of running into trucks on 3rd Street that are servicing from the front when they should be servicing from the back of the stores. And um, I don't really think 3rd Street should be used for service access. And I'm glad to see that you have some ADA compliance there, too. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? <coughs> Rachel Ponce. Good 
Hello, Rachel Ponzi. I live at 93 Fourth Street, very close to this project. <clears throat> While I'm hopeful that the Casa Rosa may be restored, I urge you to look for more reasonable and safe alternatives for this project. I am aware that restoring historical buildings is very costly and the additional three units can help the city's housing element. But the additional units in back of this historical Casa Rosa building are crowded and not safe. Allowing crowded, unsafe, and out of sight housing is not a positive for our city addressing low-income housing. There are these needs and I realize that the restoration project is very, very costly, but it's been said here many times there are grants for restoring historical uh, buildings. I urge you to please think about low-income, out-of-sight housing. That doesn't sound good at all. Thank you. Anyone else? Emily Renzel. I have two different points to give to commissioners. And this is what I previously submitted, but I just want to make sure you have it. Chairman Friels and members of the commission. I would first like to say that I'm speaking for myself as a neighbor who is surrounded on two sides by this property. Um, I have endeavored over the last 12 years to preserve and restore the adjoining Casa de Anza Adobe, including new lime plaster and a new roof. Your commission gave me an award for this effort. The amount of activity and construction proposed at the Casa Rosa site will drastically impact my property. I hope that you will do what you can to make sure that this proposed project meets the Secretary of Interior standards, in particular, considering the design for related new construction in terms of its relationship to the historic building as well as the historic district and setting. Indeed, CEQA review may only be waived if the project meets the Secretary of Interior standards. Um, I've previously mentioned a number of concerns, the exterior stairways, that strange walkway that goes all the way from the back at, along the second, above the shed roof to the second story above the Casa Rosa. Um, the lighting, I think there is a condition that requires that it not be directed outward. Noise, I hope you'll put a time limit on it. Utilities, including refuse, and also water and sewer. The current water line to Casa Rosa runs through my property and my sewer runs through that property and also the Zeller property going out to 4th Street. And I think rooftop equipment should be required to be maintained. Right now there's a quite annoying dying air conditioner over at, at the um, uh, Hardinas that should be repaired. And then deliveries need to be addressed because that is a concern. Um, the project is before you for site and design review and also for CEQA exemption. Oh dear, I'm running out of time. Although staff appears to have tried to preempt any action by you, you should use your best judgment as you review this very dense project on a largely landlocked small lot. If you don't have any discretion in this matter, then this evening's process would be a sham. My first request is that right now you don't have a full commission and I know that representatives of the Historical Society were prepared to attend the previous meeting which got continued and so they can't attend tonight. So I would urge you to continue this and 
uh, review the historic standards. Make sure the project follows the Secretary of Interior Standards. Consider an independent historic consultant. Oh dear. Um, review. The Garavaglia firm has a conflict of interest and has pushed the limits here in order to recover money owed to them by the Burtis for their work. Existing historic materials should be preserved to the maximum extent possible. I think that the stairways should be required to be interior. The, I think staff is incorrect. The current stairway is still in existence in Casa Rosa now. And um, I think obviously the front overhang is critically important. It's a very important character defining uh, issue. I would suggest considering allowing only three housing units and making the rear two story unit a one story, a one unit with an interior stairway and exchange only require maybe that to be affordable. And in regard to the affordable, how, what happens after eight years? They no longer have to be affordable? Are these gonna be Airbnb or what are they going to be? Um, I would hope that with respect to the restaurant and bar that there would be a 10 p.m. closing time as there is at Hardinas. And that's something I hope you will include as a condition. It's not enough to just talk about it, establish it as a condition. Um, Can you the, kind of going over your I'm going so way we, over. Yeah, can we could Let me just, summarize just real quick? I have just two more points. One has to do with the sewer. I share a sewer with Casa Rosa. It runs across the back of the Zella property out to fourth. Currently, there are just two bathrooms and one kitchen at Casa Rosa, and even the Berta's approval had the same idea. Um, if all these housing units, there'll be seven bathrooms, four laundries, and five kitchens, plus increased commercial space. The city should require a separate sewer line for that. Uh, and I mentioned the rooftop equipment. Um, I think that the parking issue needs to be really explored. I'm sorry I went over my time. Thank you. Any more, Laura? So um, let me ask Jennifer. Mr. Baracha, did you want to speak yes. um, during the? Uh, well, it was for this. So for the historic yeah. resources board. So, well, no, it was for this. For the his yeah. the yeah, historic sure. resources yeah, board. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Tony Baracha. Emily was saying the Zoller house, but uh, I own 35 Franklin Street, the house next to it. Um, when Jim, I purchased the house that Jim owned, and uh, when he had to build uh, the, the, the remodel that he did, he had to do a four-foot setback at that time. And I don't understand why they don't have to do a four-foot setback now. And also the driveway yeah, should remain as just as a just service area, shouldn't be a driveway itself. And I don't feel that that should be that many apartments there. That street is just impacted. Many times, if you don't get there early enough, you can't park out there. I mean, luckily I have a driveway that I can just go drive in and park inside. Otherwise, forget it. You're parking way around the corner, two blocks down. There is no way that there's gonna be enough parking for people to be there. And to use that and to say that's affordable housing for one bedroom apartments, I think we're better off using affordable housing where families can live in. Affordable housing for families, not just one bedroom apartments. I don't think that should be right. I think it should be affordable to everybody, not just a one bedroom place. And then also too, is is the water line large enough for like for the whole place there for suitable for all those apartments, suitable for fire protection. Uh, you know, I'm not sure if anybody's checked on that. And also, is there plenty of access for like protection for ambulance, you know, for fire or anything like that, for, you know, access, anything like that of the sort? I mean, some of the concerns that, you know, also to, to look for. But uh, anyways, those are my concerns. Thank you. Thank you. Moore, did you want to speak yeah, to your concern speak. also? Andy Moore. Hi, Commissioners. Andy Moore, 505 2nd Street, San Juan Batista. I've known the developer for many years. 
uh, does fine work. He had called me and said he was interested in purchasing the building. And I said, well, I, I, my first question was, how are you going to make a cash flow? Because basically, he's got to you know, almost start over. You know, inside's gutted. And I, you know, I, I think I believe that he needs some uh, a residential component. There's no way that it's it's, it's going to apply. You know, uh, you know, I don't know what a dollar fifty a foot or whatever, two dollars a foot a commercial in this town. Uh, but to make it to make it worth his while and feasible and do a great job and put money back into the project, uh, you know, he, he almost, you know, needs those residential components for the units. Uh, you know, I, I know somebody was talking about, there are a lot of single people out there. I just ran into a gal that had a three-year-old child that's looking for a little unit, you know, a teacher. So <coughs> I, I see families, but I also see people that are getting out of college, trying to get their feet on the ground trying to get moving, uh, maybe went through some hard times, they need a, a, a one bedroom, uh, they work in the county, you wanna keep them in the county. So I encourage you to work with uh, Mr. Raid and, uh, and, 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 and try to work something out because if, if not, that building is just gonna be dilapidated, it's just gonna fall apart and then it'll be like some of the other buildings in town that you know we went through and we really never got them off the ground. So, like I said, incur you know, I'm encouraging to w work with the, the owner and uh, see if we can get that building back up and running and put it back to the, hopefully the way it was years ago. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That's all that I have. Okay. Thank you. Um, we'll bring it back up to us for a minute here. The... Um, I got a question. So the CEQA, the, the CEQA stuff that keeps coming up. Um, the, explain again the exemption on that, if, we, if you please could. Or what, what sure. section it's falling under, so that way everybody knows that we're all, that all the ducks are in a row on this one. So, so while David brings that up, I'll, I'll uh, share with the commission and, and HRB. Um, Todd and I had a chance to talk to Mr. Carbaglia. The report was written in 2017. We wanted to be sure that the report was current, that there weren't any new laws, uh, and that it was truly consistent with uh, these stringent uh, codes. And he assured us that it was, um, and was very confident that uh, the exemption would be applicable. Of course, that's the author of the report, and as Emily points out, she thought that was a conflict, but I just wanted to share that, that we did check and try and verify that. So under CEQA, obviously, the Environmental Quality Act, um, not to get too much into the weeds, but the purpose is to disclose potential environmental impacts from projects. Uh, and there are specific ex exemptions provided by the state legislator to basically streamline or allow developments of certain types, single family dwellings. Uh, Class 31 or Section 15331 specifically applies to historic properties. Um, so if you're gonna repair which is why I read it, stabilize, rehabilitate, restore, preserve, conserve, or reconstruct a historic property. Um, the state legislator has determined that that, and it's subject to the secretary uh, interior standards, that that is an exemption to allow people to basically do that without preparing EIRs and litigation and delay. Um, and I can, if, if you don't mind, I, without being an attorney, I can tell you a little bit of the history or intent behind that is, is that simply if you had to prepare an initial study or an EIR due to the cost and the potential litigation, nobody would do it. It would be cheaper to demolish them um, or allow them to go into disrepair and naturally fall down. Um, and unfortunately, the purpose of this was to prevent people from doing that. Um, Historic preservation and rehabilitation is expensive when done correctly, uh, but so is CEQA if you have to do both. Um, so not lobbying for, for the developer or one way or the other, um, but that's pretty much the purpose of the exemption. So the state of California gives the, the exemption on that or the yes. pass on that yeah. just by following you, okay. Yep, and then uh, if, through the chair, if you guys don't mind, there was a question about available public parking and I actually did some research and, um, well, I don't know why. That's my daughter. I don't know why my Google Earth didn't show up. Um, 
but I'll just turn it around for, for the commission. It's going to be a little hard to see. It's just soccer field. Yeah, there's, there's parking in front of the soccer field. Um, Don confirmed with me that that could be considered public parking. Could be. That measure is about 336 feet from the site. So there is available public parking besides the one that I addressed. And that is considered this, then the public parking. Okay with that being public parking? Uh, as far as you know. Property, isn't it? Technically, it's school district property, but it's used for public property. We can work out. The city can work with that. Okay. Yeah, so I wasn't initially sure, but that, that's what I asked Don was, okay. could that be considered? And if so, just for consideration, that's within three, within 400 feet. Okay. <laughs> and then we'll bring up the, um, I think on the planning commission side, maybe the, the meat and potatoes, like plumbing, things like that, if, if, you, if you're okay with that. I'm just kind of trying to stay in the historic. Well, I, I'm, ju I'm just thinking, are there, uh, we've heard from the public, are there, is, is there anything that we need to ask staff to, to respond to uh, public comments? Uh, other than what we just, uh, we talked about parking, there were setbacks that were brought up, there was um, unsafe conditions brought up, um, overcrowding, uh, you know, and, and also that, uh, here we're talking about uh, affordable housing, um, you know, uh, more geared towards families and what have you. That was brought up. Uh, so, um, and then the plumbing and what have you, uh, and noise was brought up. So sure. there was a lot of concerns as far as the public. I mean, uh, does staff have a response yeah, so tonight I, for that? I think Ms. Renzella, hopefully I pronounced your last name right. Um, she came in and she talked to, to staff, and I think there are some legitimate concerns um, with with potential sewage. I mean, right there, there haven't been four residents there. Um, the project is con conditioned to allow installation of separate water meters, which means if the water main needs to be upgraded at the time, um, that would be the time to do it. Um, through engineering review of the building permit, a lot of that will be addressed. Uh, if there isn't adequate water lines there, they will need to be installed before the building permit's issued. Uh, she did bring up some concerns about the location of the sewer line. Um, the project was not conditioned to correct that simply for because, um, and again, this is for consideration of the Planning Commission, if Casa Rosa has to trench for a new sewer line, all existing sewer connections may or may not remain in place, and those adjacent parcels would also then have to trench for sewer lines. You can't just condition Casa Rosa to fix the sewage problem that runs to 4th Street. Mm -hmm. Either everybody fixes it and trenches new lines into 4th Street or Franklin, or nobody does. Um, there's state, it's, it's the nexus for it. You can't condition one project to fix kind of a city problem. Um, so Casa Rosa could be conditioned to do that, uh, but Ms. Renzel's property, if her sewer line runs through where that connection was changed, could also be faced with the fact that she would have to trench and run her own sewer line, as well as any, uh, whether Hardeen's or what other sewage lines connect. You can't just sever it at one spot and run a new line and leave everybody else existing. They would all have to upgrade. It's just um, Emily and uh, Casa Rosa. So, right, uh, and basically, we could condition Casa Rosa to fix it, but the city could not condition uh, the adjacent properties to fix it or allow or condition this developer to fix the adjacent properties. Um, from the evidence that's available now, there is no evidence that that sewer line would not function, but there's no nexus to require it currently. I'm not going to stand here and say that there's not a potential problem San, or, uh, San Juan Batista is an old city, uh, and you know sewage problems happen as intensity occurs. How about setbacks? Lots of, was, that was brought up. So uh, on the setback, I also hopefully I can get this picture to come up um, because I tried to pull up the existing or the uh, previous layout, and I'm not sure why that won't show. Um, but this was what Third Street looked like before. I know it's hard to see, and I can walk it up there if, you, if you'd like. This is the existing driveway that runs between, and this was the original layout. I'll just walk it up there for you. Um, so 
just so it's clear. This was the original layout of Casa Rosa, and this is the end. That's the property line. That's roughly about a foot to a foot and a half. So the application before you is mimicking what was there before and what was approved in 2017. Um, and, I, and again, through the development standards, there is no required rear setback. There's simply a 10% or 10 feet side setback. The project does meet that, and the front setback would remain existing. So again, there's no definitive rear setback. The project is mimicking what was there. Um, so it would be like for like replacement. One, one more thought too, just thinking of the future. When we put a project, if it gets approved and gets put in, it's, it's gonna set precedence. What kind of precedence is it gonna set for the city of San Juan Batista uh, building these type of units along with uh, business fronts and what have you? We do have, a, downtown we do have a vacant lot and there were projects that were brought before the city on that vacant lot that didn't work because it wasn't feasible at the time and they wanted to put in some uh, residential units as well. So, you know, I'm looking to the future here that this could be a positive thing for us, set precedence and for other areas of the town. So I would like to make sure that when we take steps to build this particular project that it will be a good thing for us to use to be a template for something else that comes along. So I would make sure it's done right. Uh -huh. um, and, and then to answer your question, I, I see, um, I don't know if it's a precedent for the city to establish a business uh, operations hours, as I guess Hardinas has, and I wasn't aware of that. Um, and then if the commission wanted to do something about parking, whether a future condition should parking improvements be made or, or other option as David described, and then, and then lastly, the, the sewer lateral. So those are the three things that I see that are outstanding. They're not necessarily HRV. They could be uh, just some sign posting. Yeah, sign commissioning, yeah. Is there anything? Um, I'm, on so many fronts, I'm excited about getting a historical building put back where it <coughs> should be. I have... Uh, I am pleased with the fact that you're working about parking mm -hmm. because that's something that really needs to be addressed. I'm very pleased that you work with a developer hand in hand to kind of get this off the ground. Have a concern with the density uh, downtown. I, uh, that's not the ideal situation in my mind. So I guess for me, uh, just weighing the pros and the cons is the way I make decisions. So just want to throw that out there. Okay. Are you all good with the uh punt this to the Planning Commission? Yeah. Moving this over? Yeah. Okay with it? Okay. It is an action item, so I guess we'll uh, we'll move to do it. Is there anybody would like to move to move this over to them? I, I move that we take this uh, plan project uh, approved uh, as through the Historical Resource Board, Historic Resource Board, um, and, and make a uh, a recommendation for the Planning Commission to approve it. Okay, and can I pigtail onto that, just saying that yeah. they make sure the developer comes back with all the all the pertinent information on what the building is going to look like, and make sure that it's, it does fit in with the historic look of our downtown. That's okay. Is that good? I'll go with that too. The color scheme and elevation. Color scheme. And elevation, Col yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll go ahead and second it then. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, we'll move on. Now we have a discussion item. No action will be taken on this. Okay. So just for the, uh, the developer, we're planning commission meets in about, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes. So we're gonna, we'll see you again. So if you can, can you hang out? for the Planning Commission meeting. Yeah. I know there's an next one after this, so. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, discussion on San Juan Batista State Historic Park Master Plan. Sorry if I give a quick presentation, yeah, Mr. You, Chair. You're up. All right, Mr. Chair, members of the board members, Todd Kennedy, city staff here. 
Uh, I'd like to go in and introduce uh, staff members from the state park. Um, Hold on real quick. Hey, folks, if, if you need to talk, to take it outside. Hey, guys. Guys. Hey, he, he's giving a presentation. Can you? Yeah, give him the. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to introduce some members of uh, the, the state park, San Juan Batista State Park here. Uh, we have uh, Marcos, we have Ray, we have Patricia. And I'd like to thank them for coming tonight. They gave us the opportunity to review the state park master um, interpretive master plan uh, dated earlier this year and they are seeking uh, city input and feedback and uh, we've been working with them very closely and uh, and anyway I believe P Pat just handed out some items to be passed out to the uh, board members um, so with that I'd like to turn the mic over to Pat uh, tonight uh, Pat Clark Gray and I just um, Mark was oh, there you are. I was like he's right behind me mm -hmm. but um, Elise McFarland is also here, mm -hmm. and I'll explain why we have so much staff here. And Ray is our archaeologist; she's the There's major two. man right there. And anyway, no. so she's handing, <coughs> giving you some handouts. The first handout is what I'm going to be covering, this one. and so it's called the interpretation master plan presentation. The other handout is I'll be referring to it, and it's the interpretive plan for the California Indian Family Housing Site at Mission San Juan oh, okay. Batista, but it's not the whole plan. <laughs> I gave Todd a complete plan, and so if you want the plan, he can make more copies, but I just wanted to do the highlights. Is this the one with Glenn Cole on the cover? Is that the whole plan? That's the whole plan, right, okay. yeah. But we're just refer gonna, because I'm trying to make it a little bit easier, so I don't have to read the whole plan. Okay. And then also, um, Ray, who's our archeologist, we have to do Native American consultation, so I thought it was helpful for you to have a copy of the process that we have to go to. So those through. So those are the three um, documents that I have, and there are extra copies for the people who just left, <laughs> for the people who are here. Anyways, um, <clears throat> why we have so much staff here is um, I work. Ray and I work for the Monterey District of California State Parks. Um, San Juan Batista was a part of Monterey District until about a year ago, and our department went through a reorganization. So now our dear Marcus is a part of the Diablo range district and Elise is brand new and she is my counterpart in the new district and so our district is finishing up the plan but Marcus and Elise and all the staff will be implementing all the ideas that are in the plan so that's why we're all here so I just wanted you to uh, be introduced to them first of all um, San Juan Batista does not have a general plan and that's why this plan is so important the likelihood of San Juan Batista. The State Park. Yeah, the State Park, right, yeah. Oh, no, not yours, yeah. yeah. Our, ours is sketchy, ours is sketchy at best, but yeah, we do uh, have. Okay, yeah. well, maybe we can refer to yours, but it is no, San Juan Batista State Historic Park does not have a general plan. And unfortunately, there are so many other parks who don't have plans, and the likelihood of getting a plan isn't very good. So that's why our interpretation master plan will be useful for Marcus and Elise and staff to at least have some sort of marching um, orders. So what a plan does, you know, a general plan is for the whole park. Uh, an interpretive plan really is just for interpretation. We come up with some goals that are measurable and how to achieve them. We have strategies. Um, this plan, I'm actually retiring at the end of this month, and I've been involved with this plan since 2011. And it should have been completed by now, but I have sort of a, a, the reasons why it wasn't. We hired a contractor, Frank Binney. He did a great amount of work. And if you look in the document, it talks a lot about it. He met with the staff. He met with volunteers. He did a lot of um, consultation with our local tribes, and I listed them there. He contacted all the, um, a lot of the fourth grade teachers, because as Marcus knows, that's our biggest group that comes here to San Juan Batista State Historic Park. So they were very important. We wanted their input. He also, at that time, there's a list of people contacted, and you can see, I'm sure your mayor is no longer this person. I don't know who your mayor is, but it was quite a few years ago. Do you all know Jolene, I guess, Cosio? Yes, we know Jolene. Yes. And so, um, so he did, he did talk with quite a few people, and of course with the staff listed, Ray, myself, and at that time, Nikki was the interpreter, and Marcus has been there now 11 about 11 years. Um, so he, he finished the plan, he gave us a 90% plan, and unfortunately he said he couldn't finish it. 
So it was, um, we had to finish it, and so that's what we're trying to do right now. So we made a bunch of changes. We sent it out to this whole group that's listed right here. We got a lot, a lot of comments from the uh, Diocese of Monterey, uh, Joel, Sean, Yahoo, Gentry? Gentry. Gentry. And I'm still going through all those comments. So we really appreciate it. He took um, looking at the plan very seriously. We're still working with our Native American groups to get com um, comments, and <clears throat> Ray can later on maybe address it. It's not, um, it's a, not a short process. It takes quite a while to get Native American uh, consultation. So we keep asking them for input, and we haven't actually received anything in writing yet, but we're going to keep, keep at it. And you can see we've expanded, um, we've added Irene Zverlin, is that how they pronounce her name? Because uh, she's the chairperson of the Ama Moots and Tribal Band of Mission San Juan Batista. When Frank was working on this, um, he had not contacted that group. So we've done you know, a great deal of effort in reaching out and obviously to the city of San Juan Batista. Uh, some of the things that we recognize in this, we need to improve our Native American interpretation and we, we want to do that. Um, a lot of the school groups can't afford the hands-on programs, which are really excellent programs. So we want to look at ways to get these school groups um, to San Juan Batista at no charge. One of the important things is the tax lot, and that's why I um, gave you this document here. Are you all familiar with the tax lot? It's the lot, and it's, um, unfortunately I didn't give you, it's right across from where the, the Gavin Sector office is. Mm -hmm. So anyways, that's State Park property. And right now, unfortunately, it's just used more for maintenance. But it's a very significant site. And if you look at the cover here, it was at one time housing for the unmarried uh, neophytes. And so um, this report was done. And it shows you um, archaeologically that there's remnants of the building there. So this particular person who wrote the plan, uh, Glenn Ferris, who is an archaeologist, made some recommendations, and that's what I um, gave copies to you of. He would like us to do some publications that could be passed out at our park office, at the mission shop, probably here. At, you know, I noticed you guys have a little rack card thing there. He suggested putting in some interpretive panels. And again, he has the copy of the whole document, but maybe a panel that showed um, where the native people were coming from, what villages they were coming from, and we would work really closely with uh, the tribal historian, Ed Ketchum. Um, maybe drawings of what the building looked like, and so this you know, shows it here so that people can imagine it. But one of the ideas was he knows that we cannot um, recreate the whole building, that maybe to put some sort of cobblestone or something where the actual building was so that people w would be at least aware of the fact that it was there and then the interpretive signs. So at least it's a start. So the important thing is, you know, Monterey District will not be um, the lead anymore, and so it will be the new um, district that will need to do that. But we want you to be aware of, you know, that lot, lot is really significant um, to the story, the telling of the st uh, mission story. Um, the other thing, what Marcus really worked on, he worked on a lot of the goals, and so he gets to, to, to implement all these. So what I did on the page that has the little interpreter panel, I just sort of focused on the objectives where you, the San Juan Batista um, city, would be involved. If we had promotional materials, hopefully you would help us pass them out. Um, uh, we would want information where people come um, with using uh, public transportation. We would, again, our, we really want to get that tax lots um, started in working with the local groups and the mission and the city. Um, and then some other ideas, I think Marcus wants to really start collaborating with the Mission San Juan, and I think he already does that, but he wants to improve that. And then, of course, develop relationships with the community organizations, and I think he already, they already do that, but again, there's always room for improvement. So I think that's the oversight. Ray, did you want to come in and talk just a little briefly about more, a little bit about the tax law? Well, hey, come on over here. <laughs> We actually got a grant to um, hire Glenn to do this interpretive plan, and we were planning on actually starting to implement it. Um, the big problem is, is as, as the plan says, it's used 
as a as a storage yard with with parking cars on it. It's it's um, those of us in the in the um, cultural resource section are just appalled by <laughs> by the fact. And the, the, the general plan does talk about what we really need to do is find someplace else to put those vehicles. And we don't, we just have, unfortunately our land and the historic park is simply, it's all, his, it's all part of the historic district. It's a national registered district. So we don't really have any spare land. So we're, you know, we, we need to look at acquiring more land or getting some sort of a partnership going with our partners where we could have another place to put these vehicles. What happened because of these, because Parks was unable to find another place for this, we lost any future grant funding from this particular fund grantor because they, they were under the impression that we were, you know, going to start rolling on this. We can't, we can't get going on our tax lot um, interpretation until we find some place to put the vehicles now, real quick and you, you say we are you with the state parks are yes you yes, yes. Okay. I, I, I'm all district this okay. is the new district yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm, I'm talking yes yeah, state parks in general state parks, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah and until they get an archaeologist or the um, cultural staff, our yeah. staff we're, still, we're still I say me because we're still the cultural staff from the Monterey district is still supporting the park because they don't have a cultural staff the new district doesn't have a cultural staff so and so I thought, because we have all of us here now, if there's any specific question, Marcus can answer any operational questions because he's been there for 11 years. He's the interpreter. What we love about him, he's a bilingual interpreter, which is which is uh, wonderful. And I think he's one of the first bilingual interpreters we have in the state, not just language, but you know, he does the um, tours. Mm -hmm. And Ray can answer any questions. And then, like I say, we can answer the whole call for her. <laughs> so do you have any? I know it's entertaining. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We just had her, we wanted her to come because she and Marcus and the new district staff will be in, you know, um, implementing but, the plan. So, so it's been, our park's been reorganized and it's been taking out of the Monterey district. District. Yeah. And mm -hmm. now it's the Diablo Range and district. And that includes Henry Coe and um, Hollister Hills. Hollister, well, then they added Hollister Hills, but also Fremont Peak. So we fought, we didn't want to lose them. We just, we love these guys, but okay. that was, it was beyond well, us. Well, you like Hollister Hills. <laughs> oh, oh, you like Hollister Hills? No, no, I said you, Monterey, like oh. Hollister Hills, because that's where no, all no, the No, 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 that actually wasn't that's even part of our district. Was. No, no, it was just Gavlin sector. The OHB parks were not a park of, part of regular parks. Okay. And when the reorganization, they put all the OHB parks into the regular So district. now we're lumped in with Co, with the Co and Fremont Peak. Fremont Peak and, and it's called the Gavlin sector. It's called the Gavilan Sector. sector okay. right, yeah. That's right. the sector, but the, the district is, is stretches all the way up to um, Mount Diablo. Yeah, yeah it's Sacramento. huge. Yeah. yeah. She does a lot of driving. Sacramento? <laughs> really? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. the district, but then the sector. Okay. The new one, yeah. So, so is is this encouraging for us because our state park is falling apart? I mean, it looks, yeah. it looks terrible. You're talking about San Juan? San Juan State Park. I'm, yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. not talking, when, when I say yeah. our state park, I'll talk about you know, San Juan. Yeah, I mean, you go, it's you very go integrated into your you city. You go to the whole, you go all, all over the state, and everybody else's state parks look fantastic. Yeah. And it's like, we're the, you know, the village that time <laughs> forgot. And, you know. Yeah. And that's kind of, that's kind of been what the joys, uh, from, from being on the inside, we see that. We see that happening all the time. And it's just management hasn't made it a priority. Unfortunately, because this district is so huge, the current district, Monterey district, yeah. I don't think that it necessarily yeah. is um, yeah. a good sign, but one thing that is good, at least in terms of our sector office is no longer here at San Juan Batista. It's now at Hollister Hills. We have a lot of room. So what I'm hoping is that we can get some of the, some of the, the, um, the boneyard, some of the vehicles to get them to Hollister Hills, clean up the place. Um, in terms of Well, our governor claims yeah. we have seven billion dollars in surplus, right. but so it'd be kind of nice if you kick a few yeah. hundred thousand down to us yeah. instead of you having to go through a grant. Right. You know? Hundred yeah. uh, yeah. million. Yeah. yeah. There is one other resource to deposit. Oh. Correct. Um, 
let me. I'm Marcos, the mm-hmm. state park interpreter. Mm-hmm. But to answer your question to the to the deterioration of our historic structures, that was the primary reason, according to the commission that took us out of the Monterey district into this new district, uh, that we would get further attention because the parks in the new district are primarily recreational. Um, there's very few historic parks. Um, so the focus will be San Juan and maybe Benicia State Historic Capital uh, is the other historic park in the new Diablo Range District. So they hope that we will be able to get more attention and funding to improve some of our buildings, which need a lot of repair um, internally and externally as well. So that's the reason why they did that. Mm-hmm. They figured that, well, if we put in the new district as the main historic park, it'll be the only one, except for Benicia State Historic Capital then we will be able to get some more attention and resources. So yeah, we now have um, Bill Lutton is the sector superintendent. So those types of issues, um, Marcus could help you um, get that, um, your concerns to Bill because he's the new, he's the new guy that needs yep, to, deal, new to deal with this. Uh, Marcus, yes, uh, Superintendent Lutton did mention the Zeller mm-hmm. House was scheduled for uh, the seismic retrofit and that's on the is that in the budget? That that is moving it's forward. They're trying Which to one? get um, a lot of that in the budget. Yeah. The Zeller house is. What was that? Which house is the Zeller Which? house? The Zanetta house. Zanetta, Zanetta, Zanetta house. house. The Zanetta house. Sorry. It Zanetta is Zanetta. the yeah. Zanetta house is the um, 1870-71 structure that's the pink and yellow building across. right on the lawn, yeah. right across from Mission San Juan. Yeah. 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 On the top it says, well, the sign's already falling off, but it says <laughs> Plaza Hall on it. Yeah. And that's that. I'm structure. familiar with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because we can't use the upstairs because it needs this, this retrofit. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's a shame. Yeah, the building, the second floor was shut down due to ADA inaccessibility. Um, all parks can't be open unless they're fully ADA accessible and for retrofit issues. So the two reasons they have to close the access to the second floor. But, but it is in the schedule. It is in the so schedule. it is. So they have, they're coming up with funding for the retrofit <coughs> and restoration of that building plus the Plaza Hotel. Uh, museum, which is in the corner of Mariposa and Second, where, where I'm located primarily. And so we have a new superintendent. Yes. For the region. Yes. The sector and superintendent. For, this for the region. sector. Uh-huh. And then and the district too is Eddie Garacha. Who was a local. Who used to be yeah. here before. Yeah, used I, to be the I, know, I grew up with Eddie. Um, yeah. yeah. The. So we'll actually have a superintendent on site. He yeah. visits. He comes. His office is at Hollister oh, Hills, okay. but he makes a point to visit San Juan at least once or twice a week. Uh, I've met with him several times. He's quite pleasant to work with. Um, he facilitated the lights in the orchard uh, and the special event permit that was required for that. And he's also talked about helping us uh, and sharing responsibility during special events and restrooms and perhaps opening the orchard as long as we can supervise it. Um, he's been very, uh, very receptive to working with the city. That's right. huge. That's great. Yeah, we want to be able, now that we're in the new district and with our new uh, Superintendent Bill Lund, who is here along with Eddie Wadacha, who's a local, with them too, he's, they're going to have to facilitate better access to the park. Uh, as a park, we are neighbors and we are, we belong to the city of San Francisco and to the state of California for all its citizens. So we want to be good neighbors and be able to provide more opportunities to the park. This is why one of our nonprofits, our main nonprofit, the Plaza History Association, they are a group of docents who do the living history demonstrations and they raise money through our gift shop at the state park. They were the ones who facilitated the restoration of our historic orchard, which is on the verge of completion. And once it's fully completed, they'll be able to have access um, to the city, to events and things like that. We're decorated for the first time in decades Mm -hmm. with Christmas lights, which is a new, new thing for us. So we're trying to have that more open. And then the other thing too, because I've worked for the department for 37 years, we had that terrible time when we had the budget cuts and we had to close a lot of parks and we actually have parks being run by park partners now. We are, we are getting a lot more money, but part of the problem is getting money for deferred maintenance. You have to have the the archeologists, you have to have the architects. And so we're just, they're just starting to gear up and they're doing a lot of hiring right now. So you're not gonna see immediate results from the, the monies, but hopefully three to five years, Sam, uh, parks like San Juan Batista will be able to get you know more mm-hmm. attention. 
So. Yeah, and I'm probably preaching to the choir, but yeah. over my 54 years, I've never seen this park look this bad. Yeah, it's gone through and a sure, lot of different yeah. I'm sure David's yeah. never seen it this yeah. bad either. Yeah. When I came on in 2008, <clears throat> we were right at the beginning of our sort of deferred maintenance and budget cuts, and uh, especially with Governor Schwarzenegger at the time in 2010, 2011, a lot of our budget kept being cut mm -hmm. further, and that deteriorated all of our buildings. Barely now, we're coming, we're basically waking up from a long budget sleep. Um, <laughs> so we're slowly, little by little, are coming in tune to that. And that's yeah. why I'm here, and we're here to present the interpretive master plan with our future goals for just the interpretation aspect. Um, programs, more access to the public, more educational opportunities, more engagement. And then the maintenance is a separate issue, but they are also waking up to the deferred maintenance that we've had at the park. But it, it's, it, you know, we in Monterey District, we have Monterey State Historic Park. There are so many historic buildings, and it takes a lot to maintain those <coughs> buildings, you know, painting them and plumbing problems, and like the first theater's been closed. So we have that big, huge um, historic park that we've been dealing with in the Monterey District. Right. And so, unfortunately, sometimes San Juan Batista didn't get as much attention. Don't attention. So yeah. hopefully with the new district, they will. But again, I, I'm optimistic. I'm retiring, but I'm going to be a volunteer, and I just I see the department getting more money, and we're getting more staff, and hopefully we will be able to do better things. But yeah, I I know historic parks have suffered, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, I <clears throat> so where do we go from here? I mean, I hear this, our staff, our city staff, you know, reaching out to the state, and the state reaching out to us. Mm -hmm. So what's the plan as far as bringing us closer together? And how do we how do we help each other support each other uh, from here on out? Yeah. Are so we going to see you once a month? So are we actually, going we'll, to they, city um, council or what? We could. That was a, that's a <laughs> possibility. Um, in the past, before I was never allowed or even considered to come and be present here at the meetings. But now, with the encouragement of our superintendent Bill Lutton, he encourages us uh, to be here. He said, "Please go as often as you can." I have a working relationship with Todd and um, Don over here, so that's a new uh, item that's happened this year. So we're, we want to continue doing that. Yeah, I, I would like to see uh, them come through us and letting us, you know, giving us update as often as they can and how we can best support you. One of the, one and of and the, if you're reaching out to us, how can we get closer together? Yeah, on one of the, a great way, and we can, and I can offer my services for this, is to invite the entire council to the park and go on a tour and just kind of discover the history of our park buildings along with the history of the mission as well. I'll, give, I do the, I'll give the tour for you. Yeah, there we go. There <laughs> we go. And we can go and I can show you not just the history of the buildings, but also yeah. the um, issues that we have structurally, um, maintenance-wise, interpretation-wise, and you can kind of see what's really there. Yeah, can we put a stake in the ground tonight to, <laughs> as, as yeah, not, maybe not an action on it, but to say that we're, you're going to come back Sure. And maybe set up a schedule That'd be great. so that we can do that. Yeah. That'd be great uh, we because can, I, I, I mean, I, we're, we're a little village, but we can be pretty vocal if we want to. Right. And I yeah. think everybody starts and squawking. In <laughs> a lot of our buildings, and we have a group, like I said, our nonprofit, our docent association, the Plaza History Association, they're a group of folks who are, are there giving up their time because they care so much about San Juan. And they're trying to raise funds. It took them over a decade to raise the over $70,000 to restore the orchard. Uh, to what it looks like now, and it's still not complete. They're still right. having a little fine, you know, tuning up. Yeah. Their next goal is to try to raise funds for painting and general sort of sprucing up of the buildings, which and was I, coming. And I, I love that fact. It just gives me so much indigestion that the seventh richest economy in the yes. world can't preserve its, it's treasures, its treasures, yes. or, or or just completely blows off its treasures. Correct. Um, I, I love the fact there's a group of people doing that, but it should never have to go to that. I mean, and we're, we're, yeah. we're and California. A, yeah, and part, of, just to let you know that, you know, we are still continuing our kind of partnership model because we recognize that, you know, we can't do it on our own. There is a new, there's, there was the California State Park Foundation. There is a new foundation that is going to be working with, I've forgotten their name, um, with um, <clears throat> state parks to raise big, big um, monies. And again, I don't know if it's for like buildings and things, but um, that might be another new source. But I was going to let you know that um, Randy Newfield um, retired. He was the maintenance chief yes. here. And I think they are looking at um, filling that position soon because he um, re um, 
had, had not been around for a while, that might have been one of the issues too of why the maintenance wasn't taking place because you need a leader at the local level. Mm -hmm. So hopefully with a new good um, employee, oh, that yeah. will help I think, too. I think in terms of the buildings, it's not maintenance's responsibility. Those are capital out. Those are projects that we need to right. do yeah. funding yeah. over and above. Big, big budget, yeah. Yes. That and totally that, makes sense. Again, that's that yeah. funding that's supposed to be coming down the pike. But, it, but to yeah, um, also down. kind of put it into perspective, this Cal, the Department of California, the Department of Parks and Recreation, which is a government agency here in California, we have over 280 parks yep. statewide. And these are huge, vast parks like Henry Cove, which is about 90,000 acres, and Zaborego down near the Mexican border, which is about 200,000 acres. No, 600,000 600, acres. Oh. And these parks are constantly growing, and they have issues that they need. And all 280 parks get the same funding. From the co this has agency. what six buildings? I mean, it's, exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Come on. And then so yeah, it's a, I it's know a, it's, it's a all situation. pucker brush and poison oak. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, <laughs> I, I fought surprised. a lot of fire up there. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, you'd be surprised how many trails they have over three hundred miles worth of trails. They also need to, need sure. to be maintained up sure. there. Uh, the campsites need to be maintained. Roads, access, panels for beaches for redwoods. Out of the two hundred and eighty, there are about 45, 46 historic parks, including San Juan that are very significant to the state of California. We have Monterey State Historic Park, Venetia Capital State Historic Park, uh, the Capitol itself in Sacramento, many, many other historic buildings. So we're all competing basically for the same. Resource. Yeah, their preservation is should be paramount. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as far as the historical no, parks like, go. You don't have the buildings. You know, I mean, I think yeah. we should have first priority when it comes yeah. to that. And then our yeah. little sleepy town here has very significant buildings. Um, like yeah. The, Four that we have yeah. from the Castro Brina Dome, which is the oldest there, uh, to the Plaza. Not to mention the not to mention the mission. Yep, yeah. Um, <laughs> That's the mission. Not ours. It's not ours. Yeah. The Mission San Juan is I a understand. Catholic church, and so they're separate from the park. But we, no, we, I understand that. We share all of our, our histories. Yeah, we understand. Yeah. That. Well, we're so, separate from the town and the state too. So exactly, yeah. And we, I work a lot with the mission in trying to kind of sync up our interpretation for our visitors, so that you have a you know better experience and sort of appreciate. The overreaching history of our buildings, not just the park, but the mission and the town. Well, this is this is huge that we're getting this right because what it, I mean, the, the impact the sixty thousand fourth graders a year. Mm -hmm. I yeah, mean, th those kids remember this stuff. I run into people all the time when they ask where I live, and they they live in you know Nevada or Newark, and they're like, oh yeah, I went down to your mission and your state park yep. when I was in the fourth grade. It's like so we get schools from a two and a half to three hour radius of San Juan. So we're centrally located, so yeah. two to three hours all around us is where they come from. We get them from, today they came from Fresno and Santa Clara, tomorrow they're coming from Salinas and Silicon Valley, so we get them from everywhere, from mm -hmm. here. And they also visit the town, as you know with Margo, they visit her in her ice cream parlor, <laughs> and Cami at the rock shop, um, and they just, yeah, and they kind of run around and tear up, you know, the town up. But then they, you know, they come and they leave, and they take that memory with them. Yeah. Very important. Yeah. But anyways, we appreciate the opportunity. Please, you know, through Todd, give us your <clears throat> comments. And again, it will be Elisa and Marcos um, kind of implementing the plan, but it's it's a start. And again, Marcus can um, let Bill know um, he will be the person who will deal more with the buildings. And then also we have um, a historian at the district level until they get one, Matt Bischoff. It, he spends a lot of his time dealing with... Um, structures throughout the district and he has like a priority list and he's been instrumental in some of the work here too so yeah, we're, we, I think we will right, still right now we just struggle to get roofs on our buildings yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. all the buildings funny. yeah well, but I, I, I want to end with um, a kind of a positive note in our district we have the Point Sur State Historic Park and we have a partner called the CCLK and they have raised millions of dollars and years ago those buildings were falling apart and in working with state parks, they have restored um, those buildings and the lighthouse included. And so there are, that's an example of a, you know, kind of a partner, the state and a um, co-op working together. Hmm. So, you know, we have, there are good examples in Monterey District and that I, I wanted to, to point out that one. And right now we also acquired the Naval Facility, which interprets the Cold War history. And they are going to um, fix up some of those buildings too. And, they're, they're just amazing and they're, you know, volunteers you know, raising funds. So when we have volunteers like that working with us, we've been very successful. That's the and facility way out on the point? Yes. Yeah, oh. um, as you're heading, you know, like Point Bobos and heading to Big Sur, if you look to the right, you see that, yeah. the rock, yeah. yeah so that's, that's cool. again, one of our, so you can see wow. we have a lot of buildings. 
in Monterey just drove yeah, but, yeah, you know, yeah. as a taxpayer, you know, state of California, if you're taking on this role, then you got to, you mean, yeah. I have to keep the roof on my house. So you right. keep, you know, oh, yeah. keep so the roofs on our house. There's a lot of roofs that are in, yeah. Yeah, in Monterey District. And, in, and like at Pfeiffer Big Sur, you know, we, ha we had all the fires and the floods and we have very significant CCC buildings there. And we're trying to figure out, you know, ways to keep those maintained too. So it's not just here. It, mm -hmm. You know, this district had a responsibility for a lot of historic It was a buildings. big district. Yeah, yeah. so. The other, the other good point, too, is that ever since, I mean, we didn't, we didn't any of these. 2013, 2012? 2013. Yeah. Yeah. From then up until this past year when they yeah. brought Bill on, we had no Except leadership here. here. Yeah. And wow. that's why you saw no presence here. Right. With, yeah. Yeah, because we, no, we didn't have enough staff at the district level. So it was really supervising rangers through was probably the other leader. Yeah. yeah. So. Great. so anyway, so I think um, a lot of positive things are going to happen with the new district. Um, please give us your comments for that plan, and I'm sure Marcus and Elise will um, try to implement a lot of those plans and make sure that the city is involved because, you know, the, and the mission and the, and the native groups and the community groups because you all have to work together to... to uh, to make this a good plan. Um, w would it be possible to invite our uh, state representatives to like a chamber mixer or something like sure. that featured at the park with the orchard during the summer or something yeah, like that? Yeah, I would think that. Yeah, that would be a great way to highlight it, especially to uh, uh, Caballero and Rivas and, and anyone else. She didn't want to have anything to do with it during her 150th. No. She didn't want to walk over. People yeah. entered, people asked her, would like to, like to take a look at the park and she Mm. But we, maybe, hopefully, we can get her over yeah. for that. Work with I know she lives local. So. Bill and Marcus, and, and then I could say Eddie, <coughs> he, you know, because he's local, mm -hmm. uh, he's even though he's person. out, you know, he's the, the district superintendent, he still cares, you know, about Shoot. this. He cares a lot, yeah, about our His parts. kids are in this area. Yeah, so. they're in school. Yeah. Um, one of the goals, since the orchard itself is not completed yet, we have one or few little uh, issues to resolve in the orchard, and once that is corrected and implemented, we plan on having some kind of grand opening ceremony to okay. get that initiated. Okay. Cool. Um, since we have, for the first time in decades, a footpath in there, um, so folks can stay in the path and still admire the fruit trees in, in there and the view, which is really unique. Um, Bill is really, our superintendent Bill Lutton is very adamant that he wants to make sure that we have uh, access for uh, the orchard to be accessible to the public and to the city. So they can see, look how we were able to fix this. It looks great. Yeah. It looks great. Yeah. And the trees that we are, that are been planted are all babies, but they'll grow and eventually they will be producing a lot of fruit. Um, and we're still not completed here. We're still going to be planting a vineyard in there soon, too. So Ooh. that's going to be coming soon. And uh, maybe you'll have your own label. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you need money. I mean, come on. Hey, it's probably a good way to raise it. Uh, we have a couple <laughs> tasting, we have do a couple you, tasting groups who <laughs> gladly do, sell it. Do you have business cards? I have mine. Yeah, I okay. didn't bring mine because I'm retiring. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah, okay. You're well, yeah. So am I. This so I can remember your name. So am I this month from the state. So. I oh, what? Do you, who, who do you? Cal work Fire. For? Oh, you're yeah. Cal Fire. Yeah. So. Oh. Can I say one word? This Cal? No, I'm just joking. Cal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that was that was one of our other issues. <laughs> Huge issue yeah. for us. Yeah. Thank you. If I could just ask a question to the Appreciate board real quick, um, sure. kind of like what was brought up earlier, what, would it be okay like on future agendas just have like a state park update item to set aside? Sure. Yeah. That'd be, be great. Cool. Sure. Okay. And yeah. just uh, that, and that way they can yeah. come. Well, since you're chatting with them often, I mean, yeah. that's, that'd be fantastic. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Keep fighting a good and fight. Thank you. Thank, thank you for thank inviting you. us. Oh, thank, thank you for being coming. here. Thank you. Thank you very okay. much, Okay, so that item's thank finished, you. six. And we're down to the comment section. Does anybody on the Historic Resource Board have a comment? Comment? David? Uh, no, I just, I went through the, the uh, interpretation master plan, and I went through the interpretation action plan, and it's quite a bit. And um, it's really worth, uh, it's really worth, oh, thank you. Uh, reviewing it word for word because mm -hmm. there are things in there that really I think stick out. I, I found about 20 different items that I felt that I could easily comment on that. I mean, there's so many things we could do as a city, as a public, you know, with the state. I mean, we're right here in the middle of things. And I think the, 
reaching out to them and them reaching out to us is really a, a, a big step right now for the future of this town. If I could just make a comment onto this, and I probably should have brought this up in my briefing. Um, several months ago, probably at the beginning of this month or this year, uh, we had um, our representative, Mary, from the Council of Governments present, you know, on that. I'm not sure if you remember that. That was like maybe February. So mm -hmm. I want to really continue that program going with our regional partners. Sure. So um, hopefully in the future we'll have um, definitely yeah. them. We already made the agenda, and then definitely – LAFCO and even county staff to come over and well I'd like to think that this commission and this uh, historic research board won't let you guys get away with anything make sure we you guys keep coming back to us <laughs> and we'll have more food for thought and, and do what we can to keep this going thing going thank you I don't have anything um, associate planner do you have anything any comments no sir nothing further see manager any comments no. Okay. With that being none, uh, motion to adjourn the uh, Historic Resource Board meeting. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned. Okay. Want to take a break real quick? Uh, just real quickly, I, my uh, notepad here is uh, tablet is dying. Do we have any agendas, please, for the Senate Commission? I need, I need the most I'm still, I'm still good. I'm, uh, I'm running just about 80%. Uh, yeah. Good stuff, good stuff. Yeah, for the uh, planning. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, let me. Scott, could you bring me one too, please? Yes, sir. Yeah, bring me one too. Thank you. Laura, just so you know, normally for the meetings, we all get into the paper agenda because when we're scrolling through on the agenda items. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, that's not. Yeah, we'll, we'll do a better job of that, Shirley. Um, I have, I, I'm, I, just, I'm covering for Trisha. I have yeah. absolutely no clue who's going to be doing what to whom, and uh, just want to put that out there. You tell them, Charlie. Sure. Now listen, Don. Right, there you go. Okay. <laughs> I'm not good about going through and scrolling and doing all that.
think I might have a, I think I might have another one here. This one here? Oh, this one there. Let me see if I have another one. I thought I saw another one here. Let me just see. Here it is. Here it is. Can you hear that? Ready? Okay, I'd like to call to order the, uh, this would be, I guess, the continued uh, Planning Commission meeting uh, for December 12th for the City of San Juan Batista. Um, can we do a roll call, please? Chairman Rios? Here. Vice Chairman McChain? Here. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, you said, you said me a second time. <laughs> hey. Don't worry, I am paying attention. It's bedtime. <laughs> it's <his> bedtime. <laughs> so I have to. Vice Chairman Metchain is absent. Absent. Board Member Brewer? Here. Board Member Delgado? And Board Member Madeira? That, that's you. That's me, okay. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> it's too confusing. A little levy. Okay, do we have any public comment on items that are not on the agenda? I do. Rachel Ponce? Okay. Well, my public comment is kind of on the agenda, but I don't want to stay that long. It, so if it's, if it, if we, it has to be okay. what's not it, on the agenda. It's not then. Okay. Uh, like I said before, I live at 93 4th Street, which is very close to 3rd Street. And um, the issue of parking came up in the uh, Casa Rosa thing. And I think that that needs to be addressed in, in all kinds of ways, not only on Third Street, but the surrounding areas. Um, I'm, my location is very near to um, the restaurants, several restaurants on Third Street. And um, with all the <clears throat> celebration of this past year of a, 150th, we certainly have gotten a lot more people in town. And I'm all for economic development and I hope that people continue to come. But on three separate occasions, I we had to call the sheriffs because cars, either their front bumper or their rear bumper were blocking my driveway and I couldn't get out. Luckily, I didn't have any emergencies, but those are things that I think need to be uh, considered in, in any new project that is being done. And certainly we need a lot more code enforcement. And it, of course, these kind of things happen on the weekends where um, at one particular time, the sheriff was way out by Bellotto Park and we had to wait till he could get somebody to come and help us. So um, parking, I think, is a big issue, and I think it needs to be considered. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Rachel, you should have been an attorney. You kind of you kind of sideswiped that one pretty good. <laughs> 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 and I know we we do have a new code enforcement um, person who's very reputable and knows this town as well as most of us, so um, we're lucky we, we got him. Any, Mr. Kennedy, any informal project reviews? No, sir, I have no uh, informal project reviews tonight. Okay, down to the consent agenda, we have to approve the affidavit of posting, approve. Mr. Chairman, that was approved at the last uh, planning, when the planning commission was started on December 3rd. Okay, that sounds good. <coughs> um, after to public hearing notice, <coughs> so that's already been approved. I'm at, uh, the public hearing, yep. And then, how about the minutes for September third? Were those yes? Those? Awesome. They're on my agenda, so. I'm All right. Um, next, which would be. Actually
actually be number five, but that's this one. We don't do the housing element, that was yeah, okay. <coughs> Consider resolution of finding site and design review for 107 Third Street is exempt from California Environmental Quality Act pursuant to Article 19, Section 15331, Class 31. Let's just do one of these at a time. Is that, are you guys okay with that instead of knocking them? Yeah. Okay, so. Um, we can probably beat this dead horse staff, but you would kind of give us another quick review as to why it's, just, just so everybody's clear that we're following the, the proper rules. Sure, the proposed project involves uh, historical restoration, rehabilitation, and reconstruction, which by state statute is exempt from the Environmental Quality Act. Okay, and we saw all that. Are you guys, do you have any questions, any more questions on the CEQA stuff? Mm -mm. No. Good. Okay, and now we're down to D. Um, actually, do we have to do a resolution? Do we have to vote on that? Huh? Yeah. The way it's kind of written now, it's kind of Yeah, where's it? Where is it? Um, it? Where is it? The Planning Commission of the City of San Juan Batista Site Design Review. Uh, I don't see it there. Okay. Okay, got it. Oh, that's old stuff. Oh, one of them, thank you. One of them, I'm unsure if it's um, this item or item 5D. Emily Rental, did you want to speak on this item or 5, the next item? Not on the CEQA review, on the design review. Okay, okay. thank you. So I don't, I don't have any public comment. Okay, perfect, thank you. Now we just have to find the resolution for C. Still looking. Hang on, let's see where I got here. Sequel. 233. 233. Where is the resolution? Let me try it. Ah. It's a single page. All the pages have the page numbers in the lower right. Yep. Okay, I guess we want a motion on this, right? Mm -hmm. I'll make a motion. Uh, for a resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of San Juan Batista making a determination for a categorical exemption for site design review, uh, SDR 2019-03, um, for a mixed-use development consisting of a restaurant, bar, and residential units located at 107 Third Street, San Juan Batista, and the parcel number is 002-021. Dash zero zero four. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? There's none. Okay. Let's see, now we're in 5D. Consider a resolution for site and design review applicant for a mixed use development consisting of a restaurant bar. Uh, is that what you just read? No. Yep. All right, we just approved that. Yep. Quickly. Okay. That was for the sequel one, right? That is sequel, okay. yeah. Okay, um, restaurant by residential units lo located at 107 Third Street, La Casa Rosa. <clears throat> As recommended by the Historic Resource Board, applicant is Raid Farad? How Farad? Okay. Sorry, I'm going to butcher that. Yeah. But, um, anything? You got any questions or comments? Not a, no. Kind of no. More? I'm still We thinking. are going to have him come back and show us the, all the pretty stuff, so. I have a major concern about, um, but I, I'm assuming that, that when you do come back with something like that, that we'll be able to vote on that and to have a lot of input into that, because since we don't know what's going to be there, right. ostensibly a the restaurant the and bar, but we don't know that. The aesthetics or the use of the, the I think Scott is referring to coming back with the elevations and the- The elevation, the aesthetics, oh, and then, but if there's a, a business that's going to come in, is that something we would see because it's in the historic district or like, you know, when we, 
for example, the, the little restaurant, the little Thai restaurant was supposed to come in. They, they had to come to us because they were bringing a restaurant. But it, is it because it's now, and it, it, it has always been, or not always, but. Uh, it's major and minor alterations to the exterior of the building. Yeah, the, actually, that's the only thing that would uh, trigger. Let me let me just kind of just g uh, give a little overview. When the type, when the Inaka's restaurant came through, because mm -hmm. I was part of that, that was actually a design review, minor alteration, because that was all exterior. That was exterior changes. The business itself, the restaurant, that's permitted by right, okay. based on the zoning code. Yeah. So, but uh, w w yeah, yeah, that's right. Unless it's a form of retail, then it's a conditional use permit. Since that was a local business, it was allowed by right. What triggered the Planning Commission HRB review was the exterior changes taking place. Okay. That makes sense. Yep. 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 Is that good? Are you good with that? Mm -hmm. okay. Anything else? Um, sir, could, could you step up real quick? Sure. I have a couple questions. Um, Go ahead. <clears throat> I know plumbing came up as Correct. far as water delivery. I don't know. You, Watsonville is old, but it's not this old. <laughs> um, we've got there's some spots in town that have terrible, it has terrible plumbing. I hope you're, you're prepared to be able to supply, d uh, deliver not only our domestic, domestic, but fire flow and all that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm sure you've thought through that. We have, because this is, we have to do a lot of that stuff to get to the building permit. So this is phase one of multiple phases that we would have to go through. Okay. I mean, the fire department is gonna require us to get put fire sprinklers. We have, we have to make sure we have get enough water flow to be able to supply not only the water to the residents, but also enough water to be able to, in the event of a fire, the sprinklers have enough uh, pressure to come out. Okay, uh, that's, uh, I know that was a big issue, and I know the plumbing is uh, the rest of the... Uh, the plumbing, the, the sewer, the a lot sewage. of the stuff that you guys, that's more comes into play when we're designing this and we're getting construction drawings, because yeah. all that's gonna come into play to make sure that it all works and has to be functioning to be able to supply it for, for the site. No. Let's uh, we'll throw some. Thank you, sir. Yeah. We'll throw some public comment out, and then is there a public comment on this. Yes. Okay. Darlene Boyd. Thank you very much, Darlene Boyd, 22 North Street. Um, I would like to speak to the density issue that was brought up during the historical resources thing. For one, for one, I took during our break. I took uh, Mr. Pratt's. Uh, brother and his nephew for a walk down Third Street and pointed out all the above store apartments that we have. So we really already have dense, what I consider urban density down here. In a sense. <laughs> oh, the fire people are, oh. <laughs> Either that or that's a little midnight auto body repair. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and um, so I don't think that, you know, what they're proposing is that dense. Um, and I do like the fact that it's affordable. Also, the historical significances. You've got to remember that historically, this was a very densely populated, Third Street was very densely populated. So to me, it goes, it goes, it's, you know, history circling right back around. So I don't consider that a drawback to the, proposal that they're making. Thank you very much. Thank you. Emily Renzel. Well, I'm probably whistling Dixie, but um, when the commission reviewed the Dirt Burtis project in March of 2017, the use was essentially proposed to be the same kind of low-key historic use with um, just one dwelling unit and the restaurant bar. Now so-called entitlements from that prior approval, which were physical improvements, uh, are being used to justify a much denser use and a larger footprint. Maybe any entitlements you might create with your decision tonight will be similarly used in the future. Because the city failed to stop demolition for about a year and a half, despite multiple inquiries about it, we neighbors are now being asked to pay the price. This property was purchased this last October for $225,100. That's less than half the median cost of one single family home in San Juan Bautista. 
Three additional housing units should not be needed to make this project pan out. I have the following requests, and um, I've already mentioned some of them, but with respect to if the, if the city is going to sell its soul to the devil for all these little affordable housing units, I don't think eight years is a long enough period of time. Those li these will last for 30 years or more. The Casa Rosa itself has been there uh, 100 years, yeah, more than 100 years. Uh, so, you know, to make it affordable for eight years and cram that density in for that is a real serious concern. Um, the proposed $2,000 a month rent for a two-bedroom unit is more than currently charged at the market rate Mission Gardens Apartments. They charge $1,545 for one-bedroom units and $1,675 for two-bedroom units for smaller affordable units and $1,825 to $1,975 for the larger pricier units and they provide parking. Um, I still would like to request that because this is mixed use and there will be people living there as well as next door at my place, um, I would hope you would establish a 10 p.m. closing time for this business. And um, I have talked to staff about the tree. There is only one tree remaining on the Casa Rosa site. It's right at the boundary, right next to the fence of my property. Yeah, but it's a significant 30 or 40 foot high tree and it's the only one on the Casa Rosa site. And I think even if a new tree were put in, I'd be dead long before it got to be that uh, tall. Um, so I just urge you to try to protect the existing tree if at all possible. And I'd like to reiterate my concerns about rooftop. I'm already out, I'm sorry, I like to talk. Anyway, Thank rooftop you. equipment, apparently Hardinas is not required to maintain their equipment. Any new approvals should require that equipment be maintained. Thank you. Okay, any more equipment questions for staff or applicants? Uh, no. So the question, it's come up a couple times, the eight-year um, window there, the, 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 the sunshine is that a state? Mm -hmm. Is that a state mandated? <coughs> so, David again, Don has a little more experience, but from my research, the only units that are generally under state legislative acts required to be restricted for th either 35 or 55 years are very low and low income units. The moderate units are, do not carry the same level of restriction over the course of years. And that, I think, is the fundamental difference with this application, is he's proposing moderate units. Um, the purpose of a moderate unit is to be a bridge between low income and market rate. Uh, and if they were restricted for 55 years, like a, a low or very low, they would be feasibly difficult to build and keep within that moving bridge unit. So the. Um the eight year is simply a, a two year cycle of the housing element, which time we could uh, hopefully um, find new housing developments, especially um, we're looking at a specific plan on the south side of town along the Alameda corridor, um, where there's more than 100 units proposed just outside the city boundaries on a, what could be a vested track map. So uh, the theory is, the, the thought was, my thought in, in negotiating uh, that number was that we would have two housing element cycles to get to eight years would get us to annexation and new potential for median income housing and, and new developments. Um, that being said, uh, our inclusionary ordinance does require 55 years, and oftentimes that's required by the funding used to build low income multifamily housing. To qualify for tax credits or to be using HUD money, Section 8, for example, is gonna require that 55 year restriction. So we have a lot of flexibility here, as David implied. Um, I was interested to hear the rents at the emission gardens, apartments, because those are actually below market value. The dollar amounts used in our staff report are based on the median income 
uh, here in San Juan Batista based on census data that we get from HUD and, and state housing community development. So we take the median income of people living in uh, San Juan Batista, we take the size of their family, and this is the formula that HUD uh, prescribes, and we take 30% of that number, and that's supposed to be the affordable amount. So uh, that's how we came to those numbers. They're based on real data from the current residents here in San Juan Batista. So it's not something we, we, we made up. Um, the fact that the market rate is less than that is interesting. That's an interesting point to bring up and should be come out in our census and as we study the data further. I didn't realize that the Mission Gardens were, were less than that. Did you? No. So that's interesting that, that our market rate is actually median. Thank you. Anything else? Well, um, yeah. What about the comments that we got in an email as far as uh, some of the, some of the messages you sent to us to, about the about the project? Is that going to be shared here tonight? Do we need to go over some of that information? This is comments uh, about the um, historical society. I mean, they they want to. Their, their recommendation is to is slow this down a little bit and come back next month and to, to really put some more emphasis on it. So I, I believe that was the message that they were sending out. Is that going to be reviewed here? Do we need to discuss that? Or staff going to present that in any way? Do you, you, mean, you mean as far as reading? Yeah. Is, do we have emails? any? We've, we've listened to the public. Do we have any emails that we need to listen to? that uh, there might be some concerns for this project tonight. Uh, those, those, those emails are part of the record. They've been provided to the, the okay, so board. And so we know what it is. And right. And I have uh, talked to a, a few of those uh, individuals uh, independent from this. Uh, there was talk about a conflict of interest uh, and, and, the, and the actual historical review occurred prior to the design of the building. It's, it's more like a design build. And when I talked to Clara Bonk in particular, she didn't realize that. Um, and so, um, I don't know, I uh, we can read those into the record if you like. We have the written copy, it's not necessary. Okay, is everybody comfortable with that? Okay, yeah, just wanna make sure. No, that's a good point. And I'd like all my original materials. Yes, I understand, thank you. It sure is, yeah, she's got, you have copies, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. From the, the two items that you handed out during the historic resource that they, well, there were two letters together that were from the last meeting and the prior meeting, and then the letter I presented tonight. Yes. So I, I definitely put in a folder here what you presented. Both things tonight. I brought you tonight. Yes. Those yeah. are in the folder. Three different folders. It's got to be here somewhere. Right, those were provided in emails prior to the meeting. So we, we, we took all the all the comments and put them into yeah. one PDF and sent them out. So we can make sure that's it's not it's not in the folder. Okay. We can make sure that's in the folder. Okay. Okay. Um, just before we just before we move any farther, sir, I, I as I said before, I grew up in this town and uh, Probably since I was about six years old, I spent every Christmas Eve in that building. Um, my grandparents and, and the, the owners, the Shockeys, were dear friends. Um, so I have a lot of um, a lot of memories from that place. And um, just thank you for wanting to save it. Um, it's very iconic in our town. Um, and uh, I just want to say I appreciate it. Um, Yeah, I know. I, I was just uh, going to bring up the um, uh, amending the conditions. Right. Do, uh, do we need to set something in motion here before we uh, uh, approve a, a resolution to make sure we've got? Uh, the only thing that the commission would need to do is state for the record whether they accept the deletion and addition of those conditions or, or not. Um, and whether they wanted to add and whether you wanted to add any additional conditions you may have thought up or developed, such as uh, a the condition noise. to require colored boards and plans to come back for approval. Yeah, um, that's definitely. And I, I wrote that down. That would be condition 34 on the final resolution. Okay. Um, okay. 
So we're good to go as far as that with the deletion part. And uh, so we're, we're good. Yeah, I think we're trying to now that we've got all this in there. Can we add a closing time if we don't know what's going to go in there? The, the, the question? Oh, okay. Um, a closing time? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, if we don't know what's going to go in there. A noise time, you know, 10 o'clock, just like Hardeen's right. down at 10 uh, o'clock. Yeah, we'll make sure that that's in there when we make the motion. So that would be condition 35. And we've already made a note of that, so that's going to go in. So condition that'll 35. be that'll, all the conditions. I think there are 33 altogether. Right, so we're down to two. And we're deleting two. The first one, on the, and, and there's nothing in number nine. Correct. So yeah. after the memo, condition, existing condition one would be eliminated. That's the development agreement. Is it, so is this in the resolution? Because yeah. I need to, if we're making changes, I need to make that on here. Yeah. Okay. So can you, I'm looking and I'm not. I, I don't think it's in the existing resolution. It would have to be amended, um, which, which can be done as early as tomorrow. It's, it's not too complicated or I could type it tonight and email it. So the, okay, so the deletions were not, we're not I'm not, the, the paperwork I have here doesn't have to. Does not show them, right? Because the, the commission right. would have to agree or, or not agree Are with those They're the original conditions, yeah. Yeah. So it, the, the recommendation is to delete existing condition one. Obviously they would be renumbered. Oh, it's a memo that was given to the planning okay. commission. Right here. Yeah, I have, yeah I it's have that, that. It's that memo. So yeah. You're looking for condition so one. It's not. It's not shown. Yeah. In, in your structure. Yeah, condition mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Right here. Exhibit A, conditions of approval. Right there. Uh, that's not just it. No, it's right here. That's condition one right there, being eliminated. So you're talking about exhibit A, right? That's yeah. Where these are? Yes. Or well, we can make note of that yeah, I right we, uh, as we make notion, uh, make the motion. Uh, do you want to do that, Shirley, or do you want me to do it? Or? Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Here we go. We're going to make a motion. Uh, Let me get the resolution here uh, so I can read it off. This one's just written. Uh, conditions. No, I want this. Here we go. I think it is. Okay, here we go. Uh, I'm going to make a, a, a resolution here to adopt. Uh, it's going to be resolution number 2019-27. 27. Uh, resolution of the Planning Commission of the City of San Juan Batista approving a site and architectural design review permit, SDR, uh, 2019-03 for a mixed-use development consisting of a restaurant, bar, and residential units located at 107 3rd Street, San Juan Batista. The parcel number is 002-021-004. And this is also to include the fact that we include all the conditions that are listed and all with the exception of one being deleted, the first one, and nine being item nine, it's, uh, there's nothing there to be deleted anyway. And to add the last one, which I believe is item number 33, as a noise condition of, a, no, a condition to um, mitigate noise or whatever we have to do with that at that time. So I actually have the addition of oh. um, three total conditions. Oh. One would be the formula retail condition on the memo. One oh, would okay. be the requirement for the applicant to come back with color boards and elevations for approval. Right, got it. And a, the third one would be the limitation on business hours to not exceed 10 p.m. Got it. Right. So with those conditions in mind, I approve make a motion to approve it, the I resolution, second. which is number 2019-27. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No opposed. Thank you.
Okay, we're down to comments. Planning commissioners, any comments? He's all geared up for a whole bunch right now. I got it. Yeah. Might as well get yours in now. <laughs> How much time do you have? <laughs> no. no, I just want to uh, thank everybody for coming back for another meeting. I know everybody hates other meetings, but I do appreciate that on my behalf. Thank you so much. I do want to thank everybody for being here tonight. Just to remind uh, everybody that we will have other meetings, and if you have family and friends, don't hesitate to invite them because the more people we see down here, the better it is, particularly for our public. We'd like to see more. Uh, but I want to thank our staff for working so hard on all this and our developer and David Mack for all the hard work in his presentations. Awesome. I really like that. Clarified a lot of things, even though I forget who I am sometimes. <laughs> so with that being said, uh, thank you again for ev everything. And it's good to see uh, Scott here. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I also want to thank, you know, for the last year for your hard work, you know, and, and getting things done with us and things are going, I think, in the, in the right direction. The, all, my only request is um, so we aren't so confused and take up time, can we make sure that our, our agendas are updated correctly or if there's a change in the resolution that we actually, can we get that done? Can we, you know? I, I shouldn't have to scratch out stuff and try to make up my own agenda. Understood. I apologize for that. It'll frustrate. And, and I, I'm, I know it's just, I'm sure there was plenty of things going on in City Hall at that time, but, um, and we did rush through it. Um, and uh, just Merry Christmas. Have a great New Year. Oh, yes. Merry, happy holidays. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Okay. From me, too. Okay. Associate City Planner, any comments? No, sir. I have no further comments. <laughs> uh, city planner? City manager? Or city manager? No, but I did want to thank David uh, for his first planning commission meeting, and uh, we look forward to working uh, with him on, on more successful projects. Thank you okay. very much. David, do you have anything to say? Just throwing it out there? Uh, no, just thank you for the warm welcome. Sorry for the uh, fairly lengthy <laughs> staff report. That's okay. No, um, no. But That's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, okay. Right. Hopefully, I'll see you all more. Yeah. All right. um, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. Thank you. Thank you.